Hi, I'm Sergio Motella. I own Melovino Meadery and we make craft mead. We're here today to talk about making mead, how I originally got into it, ingredients, their values and importance, the fermentation process, mead styles, conditioning, packaging and carbonating, fruit additions and troubleshooting off flavors. So I got started making wine at home at an early age. Uh, my, my family all came from Portugal. First of my family would be born here in the US. So we grew up in a culture where home wine making was a way of life. So as an adult, I started making wine myself at home. Uh, found my way into brewing beer and ultimately discovering mead for the first time a few years ago. Uh, so basically making wine was very non-creative. Uh, it's very straight cut. You know, Merlot has to taste like a Merlot. A Cabernet has to taste like a Cabernet. Um, but when I got into brewing beer, I kind of discovered, wow, the creative window was completely wide open when it comes to brewing beer, uh, which I fell in love with instantly. Uh, then with mead, the interesting thing was it's very much produced like a wine is. So it was everything I was familiar with from the winemaking side of things. But I had all the creativity that brewing beer brought to the table and I instantly fell in love with like, this perfect hybrid of the two. I got really good at what I was doing at home, starting winning medals at competitions and decided to focus more and more on the mead making stuff. And now I own Melovino Meadery, the first and still only meadery in the state of New Jersey and one of the fastest growing meaderies in the country. All right, so when it comes to honey, quality is definitely the utmost importance when it comes to making mead. Uh, it is pre the predominant fermentable sugar source, uh, or sometimes in most cases, the only sugar source that you're fermenting in a mead. So the quality of the honey that goes in is gonna determine the quality of the mead that comes out. So it's very important to kind of understand what honey is and the different types of honey and what they all contribute to the final product of a mead. So we have many different types of honey varietals out there. For every floral source there is in the world, there's a different honey varietal. So if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what would. Uh, so there's many different types of honey varietals, even more than there are grape varietals. And just like a grape varietal, uh, a different grape varietal will make a different final product than a wine. A different honey varietal will make a different final product than a mead. Uh, so it's very uh, important to understand the type of honey and the character of that honey varietal that you're using. Uh, to determine what kind of mead it's going to produce at the end. Uh, so in the honey world, or at least in the mead making scene, uh, the, the honeys, the most popular honeys that we use for mead making are usually wildflower honey, clover honey, alfalfa honey, orange blossom honey, uh, tupelo honey, even though a little bit more uh, costly and, uh, and less available than most other honeys, if, but it makes an, an amazing mead at the same time. Uh, there's also many other different types of honeys obviously that you can use, but in the mead making scene, I always felt orange blossom, clover, and wildflower honey are like the three staples, at least that I love to use, uh, and could cover a variety of different uh, styles of mead making and different recipes and working with different ingredients very well. So as far as finding honey and the type of honeys that you want in particular, a really great website is honeylocator.com. Uh, with the National Honey Board, then you can search and find uh, any type of honey varietal that you'd like and different beekeepers and apiaries that you can actually purchase from. For an example, uh, some of the best honey that you could ever use is fresh out of the hive from a local beekeeper. Uh, and I'm sure most beekeepers will package uh, their, their honey in, uh, usually they package in one pound jars like you see here or sometimes you know, in just regular mason jars or s certain bigger uh, types of containers, you'll see a five pound container here. Um, and as far as the different honey varietals, you know, a lot of them are different uh, shades. Uh, so it could go from pretty light, even lighter than this, almost the color of water, uh, but it could go then from like a golden amber to a little bit darker to almost like black in color, so dark brown. Uh, so for example, this would be a buckwheat. Uh, honey, uh, which is very, very dark in color, uh, very strong flavor and very strong aroma as well. Uh, so buckwheat honey will give sometimes a little uh, almost like barnyard so, uh, slash horse stable uh, type of aroma, uh, which if used correctly in the right amounts can actually contribute a really nice uh, undertone of maltiness um, and uh, savoriness to a mead. Uh, we also then have uh, something uh, in between, sometimes you get a, a dark clover honey or a dark wildflower honey uh, that can produce a lot of nice toffee, floral notes, um, and uh, almost a little caramelly as well, uh, slightly burnt sugar. 
Uh, and then you get into your really lighter honeys, uh, your alfalfa honey, your uh, orange blossom honey, which has a really nice uh, orange blossom honey, for example, has an extremely nice floral citrusy note that really represents the essence of the nectar source that it comes from. Uh, so you could go quite, quite a bit all over the board as far as different types of honey varietals, different shades, uh, and you could even start experimenting with using blends of different honeys in a mead. So, we can have a traditional mead and use a blend of two different honeys or three different honeys. I do that quite often if I want to add complexity. Uh, maybe I like the, the nice uh, slightly lower acidity uh, that an orange blossom honey, for example, will bring to the table, but I want a little bit more roundness. So I'll use maybe one third or even less of a darker honey to kind of round that out a little bit. Uh, so you can kind of experiment with different combinations and or just single honey varietals to really see exactly what that specific honey varietal will give you at the end of the day. Uh, because at the end of the day, once fermentation is done, you're basically tasting what that honey actually is without the sugar in front of it. You know, during the fermentation process, you know, the yeast are consuming the sugars. Uh, and as they're consuming the sugars, you're slowly starting to taste more and more what that honey really tastes like. Uh, same thing in a grape wine. Grape wine doesn't taste like grape juice. Uh, tastes like grape juice with all the sugars removed and some of the esters and other byproducts from fermentation that the yeast provides. But it's really interesting to see exactly what that honey will taste like after fermentation. I mean, think about it. What does honey taste like with no sugar? Uh, a mead is basically your answer to that. So we're gonna talk about water for a quick second. So water is very important when it comes to mead. Uh, you want to use something that's very, very clean, something that's uh, a filtered water, uh, store-bought spring water, uh, or even a reverse osmosis water. Uh, that's what I like to particularly use uh, for the mead making that uh, we do here at the meadery. Uh, so the perfect example that I could kind of give you guys as to how important water is to a mead is for most of your average mead recipes, it is about one part honey to four parts water. So if you don't think water quality makes a big difference in a mead, I beg to differ. Perfect example, depending on your water source at your home, uh, you can have very high uh, mineral content in your water, extremely hard water, or you can have extremely soft water anywhere in between. Uh, so it's gonna make a big difference, especially when you don't have much calcium in your water, uh, your meat is not gonna want to clear up and clarify naturally. Calcium is a big proponent in clarification in any kind of a fermented product. Uh, so it'll help uh, dramatically. No calcium in water might be great for your coffee or espresso machine and to keep your stainless steel sink clean. Uh, but when it comes to brewing beer or making mead or even wine, uh, minerals, different minerals in the water are gonna play a significant part. Even with reverse osmosis water, which by definition, it has all its nutrients removed, we are adding some nutrients back to the water during the fermentation process, which we'll get into in a little bit with our nutrient additions. So as you can see, water is a big proponent in the character of the final product of a mead. Uh, so you wanna take your water into consideration when you do wanna make mead. Again, quality in, quality out. So yeast and nutrients, this is when a water and honey mixture starts becoming a mead, particularly with the yeast. Uh, so yeast selection is pretty important. Uh, we have an example of what dried, um, dried yeast will actually look like. Uh, normally in the homebrew scene, you'll find it in five or eight gram packets. Uh, in the commercial scene, we buy it in about 500 gram packets, these large vacuum sealed bricks they basically look like. Uh, but this is basically what it looks like. It's all the same on the inside. And there's many, many different types of yeast that you can use when it comes to mead. So there's home brewers that have expended quite a bit with using ale yeasts or even lager yeasts that normally are used for brewing beer. Uh, in, the, in the commercial and in, even in the homebrew mead scene, wine yeasts are most, mostly used uh, to make mead. So you could get quite a bit of selection for most of your homebrew shops, uh, whether online or local to you. Uh, but I think in mead making, there's certain wine yeasts that are in particular really great for making mead. One of which, which I think it would be agreed upon across the board by uh, most home brewers and commercial meaderies, would be 71B. It's uh, Lavalin yeast, uh, it's a dry yeast again, uh, comes from the Narbonne region of France. Uh, and it's a really, really great yeast that matures nice and young, so your mead will be um, ready to drink and mature enough to drink a lot sooner. 
uh, which I'm sure everybody wants, particularly when the stereotype for mead, I think, used to be that it's gonna take about a year or two before it's ready to drink. Uh, with the proper fermentation protocol, the right yeast selection, and the right uh, nutrient additions, uh, you can turn that all the way down to three to four weeks or three to four months. You really don't have to wait a whole year or two before your meat is ready to drink. Uh, so uh, 71B is a really great yeast. Uh, another, another great yeast selection would be D47. Uh, D47 provides almost, in a traditional mead, it offers a little bit almost of, a, of an apple character to a mead. Uh, so I've noticed a lot of people picking that up uh, as well. Uh, so D47 is really great. CY3079 is also an interesting yeast to use uh, when it comes to making mead. Uh, and it's technically a Chardonnay yeast, which uh, even on its own in a white grape wine will actually produce uh, some really nice honey characters. So you can see how uh, that would be pretty interesting even in a mead when it's actually fermenting honey, but uh, you'll get some nice honey, buttery notes, even a little bit of a pineapple character, uh, especially with certain lighter honeys when you use CY3079. So that could be a particularly interesting yeast to use as well. Uh, but across the board, especially if you're starting off, I always recommend 71B as the main yeast to use in the beginning because it's gonna produce a really great mead nice and easily and, and uh, rather quickly. Uh, compared to some of the other yeasts as well. So nutrients. Nutrients is a huge thing when it comes to making great mead. Without yeast nutrients, you are going to have to wait a good year or two before your mead is ready to drink. Uh, so I've developed my own type of nutrient protocol, uh, which I've coined uh, TOSNA. It's uh, T-O-S-N-A. Uh, it stands for Tailored Organic Stagger Nutrient Edition. So basically what it really um, consists of is using two different types of product. Uh, one is GoFirm. Uh, GoFirm, uh, which you can see is a slightly uh, darker than the other nutrient here, which we'll talk about in a second, but GoFirm is really important when it comes to rehydrating your yeast. Uh, so when you're working with dry yeast, you're gonna wanna rehydrate it uh, according to a certain protocol. Uh, you heat up some water to 104 degrees uh, and you allow the yeast to kind of absorb the water and basically rehydrate itself. Uh, with GoFirm, GoFirm is a particular, uh, particular uh, yeast uh, energizer. So when the yeast is actually rehydrating, the GoFirm is actually gonna help build up really strong cell walls, provide nutrients within the cell wall, uh, and really let that yeast uh, really uh, rehydrate properly and get nice and strong in a really healthy state to start fermenting your mead uh, as quickly and as cleanly as possible. Uh, it's gonna make the, your yeast basically less susceptible to uh, higher alcohol conditions, uh, too low of nutrient conditions, too high of temperature conditions. Uh, it's really gonna help the, the yeast really have a really nice clean fermentation. At the end of the day, uh, the most important thing when it comes to uh, fermenting mead, fermenting beer, fermenting wine, is you wanna keep your yeast happy and the happier you keep them, the, the, the better job they'll do for you. Uh, so go firm is a very important first step uh, before you even get to adding anything to your mead. Uh, as far as the yeast goes, go firm is very important to get your yeast really nice and rehydrated and strong and ready for whatever you throw at it. Now when we're talking about actual nutrient additions to your mead making process during the fermentation process, uh, you're gonna want to supplement the yeast with nitrogen. Honey itself is very deficient uh, in nitrogen, which is an important element and nutrient in the fermentation process that the yeast does need for a healthy and clean fermentation. So with mead making, what turned everything around was a few years ago uh, when staggered nutrient additions were introduced to the mead making scene. And people started using products like DAP, which stands for diamo um, diammonium phosphate, uh, or Fermate K, uh, which also provides an inorganic form of nitrogen, or sometimes a combination of the two. So recently, there's been another product on the market called Fermate O, uh, which Fermate O contributes an organic form of nitrogen. So comparing the organic versus the inorganic, uh, Fermate O provides organic form of nitrogen that basically allows the mead, or the yeast rather, to have a nice steady fermentation uh, without much of a spike in fermentation. Uh, when you use an inorganic form of nitrogen, you're gonna have a huge spike. It's gonna rock it off uh, and then just slowly kind of like peter out. 
So it's going to increase temperature of your fermentation. Uh, it's also going to produce or be more likely to produce higher sulf uh, sulfite compounds uh, during your fermentation process that will lead to off flavors and uh, aromas as well. Uh, so using, using an organic form of nitrogen is particularly interesting because it's going to have a nice steady fermentation process with a really nice curve. Uh, throughout the entire fermentation. It's not going to increase your fermentation temperature as much as an inorganic form. It's not going to produce as much sulfide compounds. Um, and it's also going to help buffer the pH of your mead uh, during the fermentation process, which is another huge deal uh, when you're talking about fermentation, uh, fermenting honey. Uh, so if, you, if the pH level drops too low during the fermentation process, uh, you're gonna, it's going to result in a stuck fermentation, which a lot of people, when they start making meat at home, uh, they follow the staggered nutrient additions that are kind of like the cookie cutter nutrient addition uh, protocol out there that everybody started using when they first started making meat. And they will still run into sluggish or stalled fermentations. Uh, and that's mainly because of two things. Either you're not providing enough nutrients or enough nitrogen for your yeast uh, during the fermentation process, or uh, you're just spiking too, too early on in the fermentation process and it's going to peter out and slow down and just completely stop before you really get to the end of a complete fermentation. So as far as adding your nutrients to your mead, that's also pretty important. So you want to step feed all of your nutrients during the fermentation process. You don't want to add everything up front because the yeast can only metabolize certain amounts of nutrients at a single time. So you're essentially, if you're adding everything up front, you're essentially uh, feeding other uh, possible spoilage bacteria or other organisms in your mead that you don't want to feed. You just want to feed your yeast. Uh, think about it, you know, as far as like feeding a dog. You want to give your dog just enough food. Uh, you don't want to throw food all over the floor and have every other dog come by and just eat up all the food. You just want your dog to eat and that's it. So as far as step feeding your nutrients into your mead, uh, we recommend adding 24 hours after you've pitched your yeast, uh, then 48 hours, then at 72 hours, and then either uh, when you reach your one third sugar break or on day seven, whichever you reach first. Normally with the Tazna protocol, uh, you're gonna reach your one third sugar break before day seven. Uh, so your meat is practically gonna be halfway done fermented in about a week, uh, if not less. So for more information about uh, the actual schedule of step feeding your nutrients into your mead and also how much of the nutrients to actually add, uh, you can visit the website that I've put together called meadmaderight.com and you'll see the whole Tazna protocol on there broken out so you can figure out exactly how much nutrient to add to your particular batch. Again, Tazna is a tailored organic stack of nutrient addition, so it's gonna vary from recipe to recipe. So you're gonna to wanna to take your starting bricks or specific gravity reading and basically that, and, and your starting volume as far as how many gallons that you're using, and that's what you're gonna to use to determine exactly how much nutrient to add to your must. So it's no longer a cookie cutter type of recipe when it comes to stacking nutrient additions. You're gonna add exactly how much you need, uh, whether it's more or less, depending on the type of batch that you're making. So when rehydrating your yeast, it's particularly important to rehydrate it properly. Otherwise, you're gonna buy, your, you're gonna buy yeast that's just gonna be uh, put to no use or just killed off before you even add it to your mead. Uh, so on the Mead Made Right website, you'll actually see a proper uh, yeast rehydration protocol. Uh, that we use here at the meter and it works wonders every single time. Uh, so in general, basically, uh, the amount of yeast that you're gonna need for your mead is gonna depend on uh, your starting gravity and the size batch that you're working on. Uh, so normally with most starting gravities um, for, uh, for your average mead recipe, uh, you're gonna wanna add about two grams of yeast per gallon. As far as the go firm, the amount of go firm that you're going to want to use to rehydrate your yeast is going to be 1.25 of the weight of the yeast that you're using. And when you rehydrate, the amount of um, water you use is going, to is going to be determined by the amount of go firm that you use. So you can see how everything has to do with one another. First, you figure out how much yeast you need 
which will then determine how much GoFirm you need. Uh, and then we'll determine how much water you actually need to rehydrate those two together. It's, it's very actually important because uh, if you use too much water, you're not going to have as much osmotic pressure as the yeast are going to need to really be able to consume as much of that GoFirm as they can. Uh, so you're really not going to get the best out of it. Uh, so I definitely recommend following the yeast rehydration protocol on meadmaderight.com and it's step-by-step -step instructions as to exactly how to get a really great yeast starter before pitching into your mead. And another really important point is even after all that work and, and figuring out how much of what to add in uh, to your yeast rehydration, uh, you're going to want to make sure that your yeast starter is basically uh, within 10 degrees or so of your actual mead must. So the water and honey mixture, uh, you don't want to add in the yeast starter, the yeast slurry uh, into your mead if it's uh, too much warmer or even too much cooler than your mead. Basically, then you're just going to put your um, newly rehydrated healthy yeast uh, through cold shock. Most of them will die off before they even start fermenting anything in your batch. So you definitely want to want to temper your yeast slurry before adding it to your mead. Uh, the easiest way to do that is in whatever container that you have your yeast slurry in. Uh, just slowly add a tablespoon or so of mead at a time uh, every five or ten minutes. Uh, take your time with it. There's no rush. You're going to have to wait a while for the fermentation to happen and for the mead to be ready to drink. You might as well take just a few extra minutes. Uh, it's not going to be extra days. Take a few extra minutes uh, to properly temper your yeast slurry before adding it to your mead. Because uh, again, if it's out of temperature, the yeast will go through temperature shock uh, and you're going to have a sluggish or a stall fermentation. All right, so fermentation. Now that we're ready to start making a batch of mead, uh, you're going to want a little bit of equipment before you get started. Uh, something as simple as a food grade plastic bucket is a great uh, mixing vessel as well as fermentation vessel for your mead. Uh, I always like to start all of my meads uh, that I make still on small batch experimental batch scales here at the meadery. I still do them in plastic food grade buckets uh, such as this one. Uh, if you could get yourself from some homebrew supply shops, uh, one with some, um, some gallon markings, it makes it even easier when you're mixing up your mead. Uh, so the first thing you want to do and the most important practice in any kind of fermentation protocol is sanitation. You want to clean and sanitize everything that you're using uh, during your mead making process. So uh, two of the most popular products, and we still use them here at the meadery, uh, is um, Five Star Chemicals provides uh, PBW. This is a really great, powerful cleaning agent. Uh, uses, uh, it cleans with oxygen, and I kind of think of it as a uh, oxyclean on steroids, for example. It really gets uh, tough uh, messes and stains out of almost anything if you let it sit long enough. Uh, so uh, PBW is a really great cleaning agent. Uh, this is basically what it looks like. It's a white powder uh, that you dilute into the water, depending on how much uh, water you're actually going to need or cleaning solution you're actually going to need. So you want to mix this up with water, um, have it sit inside of your cleaning vessel, uh, use a soft cloth uh, if you're using plastic so you don't scratch uh, anything uh, inside of the bucket itself. Any little tiny scratches uh, will be able to harbor any bacteria or spoilage organisms. So use a nice soft cloth or a very soft sponge that won't scratch up plastic. Uh, so you go around and clean out the inside of your uh, fermentation vessel, clean any type of uh, stirring equipment, whether a plastic spoon, a stainless steel spoon or paddle uh, like we have here. Uh, anything that the mead is basically going to touch or that is going to touch the mead uh, should be clean and sanitized. As, so that's as far as cleaning sanitization. Uh, the most popular product, and we still use this here also at the meadery, another product from Five Star Chemicals is Star Sand. Uh, they also have a, a lower foaming uh, option, which is called Sandy Clean. Uh, this is a really great, um, basically, contact sanitizer. So you're going to want to use one ounce of Star Sand for every five gallons of water that you use uh, that you're going to actually make your sanitizer with. Uh, with those five gallons, for example, you can easily throw it into the same bucket that you're about to use for your fermentation vessel. You throw everything in, uh, your mixing paddle, uh, your hydrometers, a, um, a stirring wand, anything that you're gonna actually use uh, during the mead making process. Uh, just throw it into the sanitizer and let it sit for a minute or two. Uh, you can just put it into a separate bucket and have everything pre-soaking before you even get started. Uh, is a really great idea to make sure everything is nice, clean, and sanitized. And this is a no-rinse sanitizer. You could easily dump this out 
uh, not have to worry about needing to rinse anything out. Uh, it's really, uh, there's a particular thing as far as foaming goes that a lot of people are preoccupied with. Usually star sand produces a decent amount of foam. Do not fear the foam is the suggestion from the manufacturer. The foam is just safe. Uh, it doesn't matter if there's a little bit of foam in your bucket or on your stirring wall or anything like that. Uh, the foam is just gonna be safe uh, for your mead making or beer making or anything that you're using star sand for. Uh, so star sand is a really great product for that. If you're not into as the amount of foam that star sand does produce, like I said, they do produce a, another product called Sandy Clean. Uh, that'll require a little bit longer contact time, but it'll produce a little less foam than star sand. So as far as mead making, um, mead making tools, another great thing to have, unless you pick yourself up a digital refractometer or an analog refractometer, uh, you're gonna wanna get yourself a nice hydrometer tube and a hydrometer. Uh, so there's hydrometers in various different scales. Uh, there's, you can get a hydrometer that basically does everything, um, has a much larger scale all in one, so you only need one of these. It's always great to have a backup hydrometer if this is gonna be your only method for actually uh, measuring your sugar content in your mead, uh, because these two do tend and you know, have a really great reputation for slipping out of your hand and breaking. These are made out of fragile glass, uh, so having a backup is never a bad idea. Uh, especially when you're using cleaning agents that can be a little bit slippery, uh, running them underneath water, they can easily slip out of your hand. So the difference between using a hydrometer and a refractometer is with a hydrometer, you're gonna need enough product in your hydrometer tube for the hydrometer to actually uh, work. Uh, so you're gonna need a decent amount of product, which especially when you're talking about sanitation protocol, you're not gonna want to add this product back into your mead. Uh, you're always gonna risk infection uh, or spoilage of your mead. So you, you're kind of putting a decent amount of product to waste, uh, even though you could drink it with that, so you don't waste it, but throwing it back into your fermentation bucket or aging uh, vessel uh, is not recommended, uh, just for a risk of contaminating anything that you've already got going. Uh, so with the refractometer, uh, the, the coolest thing about it is all you really need is like a drop or two onto the refractometer. And if you're using an analog one, you just hold it up to the light. And with the drop or two, you could actually measure the actual bricks uh, or, uh, of the mead. Uh, or there are hydrometers that also have a specific gravity scale built into it uh, as well. And also when mead, uh, for mead making in particular, refractometers are more made for the wine scene. Uh, so some of them might only go up to about a 30% uh, bricks, you know, 30% sugar, 30 bricks. Uh, so you're going to want, if you're going to use a refractometer for mead, you might want to look into a, a refractometer that goes a little bit higher than that uh, if you're going to want to get into your sweet mead making as well. Uh, so that's the difference between using a hydrometer and a refractometer. Uh, so a lot more waste with hydrometers and hydrometers also a hydrometer reading is also going to depend on the actual temperature of the must as well. So there's always going to be a little variance and you're going to want to calibrate that and take that into compensation as well. So as far as fermentation and starting to put your batch of mead together, uh, you're gonna wanna take into consideration that honey is gonna vary in sugar content. So uh, honey could be anywhere as low as around 78, 80% sugar, all the way up to about 96, even 98% sugar on the very high end. Uh, so you're gonna want to take that into consideration when you're working off of a recipe that calls for a specific amount of honey. Usually the best thing to actually uh, go uh, according to is the actual starting sugar. Uh, so you measure your sugar. Even if you work off a specific honey uh, amount uh, for a particular size batch, uh, just keep that as a reference, but keep in mind that it's, it, it could be a little bit less or higher than the sugar that you're uh, possibly shooting for. So. Uh, start, amount, start with a specific amount of honey that you know is gonna get you within that range of your starting bricks or starting sugar um, uh, target, uh, but then you know, be able to either add a little bit more water or add a little bit more honey to kind of balance it out and hit your starting gravity. Uh, so basically you're gonna wanna dump in, um, the easiest way that I found to, to make meat, especially at home, is to start dumping in that starting amount of honey into your fermentation bucket uh, or carboy. And, and then heat up about a gallon or so of water. So if you're making a five gallon batch, heat up about a gallon or so of water. 
Uh, that way, that water is going to help dilute that honey uh, in the beginning. It's going to make the, the whole mead making process a lot quicker, a lot smoother. Uh, so you're going to uh, dilute that honey into that starting amount of water. Then you can start adding in your cold water or colder room temperature water. Uh, it doesn't have to be hot or cold. But, and then you start filling it up until you get to about uh, close to your starting uh, target volume, let's say five gallons in this case. Uh, so uh, you stir everything up uh, really nicely with a stainless steel spoon or mixing paddle, plastic spoon, as long as it's clean and sanitized, it's just fine. Uh, mix everything up, make sure you get all that honey that might be settled at the bottom, whatever might not have diluted with that starting amount of water up to the top, get everything homogenous uh, before taking any kind of a reading because you could take a reading of some uh, you know, more water on top than your thicker sugar at the bottom, and then you have an off reading. So you wanna make sure everything is well mixed before you take any kind of a reading, especially in the beginning. Uh, so mix everything up nice and properly, and uh, take your reading, uh, add a little bit more honey or a little bit more water if you need to go up or down on your starting uh, sugar content uh, until you hit that mark. Uh, once you have that uh, all taken care of, obviously the, the mixing utensil could be removed, uh, you can add in your yeast slurry as soon as it's been rehydrated and tempered to around the same temperature as your bead must uh, and add your yeast slurry in. You throw a lid over the top of your bucket with an airlock or you can also just take uh, some towels and just loosely uh, wrap them or tie them down over the, um, over the fermentation vessel as well. Uh, during the fermentation process, especially with mead, in wine yeast, oxygen is actually a good thing, uh, specifically in the beginning parts of fermentation. So you're gonna wanna introduce oxygen uh, into the must during the first few days or first half of fermentation. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to completely close it off from the surrounding uh, environment by putting a, uh, a lid on your bucket or, or an airlock on your carboy. Uh, you can just keep it actually slightly open with the lid just slightly off to the side or if you're worried about fruit flies or any bugs getting in you could just like I said before just cover it with some cloths um, that way that'll protect it from anything falling in. As far as fermentation management now you're gonna get into your nutrient regimen so uh, 24 hours after you pitch your yeast your first nutrient addition is gonna take place. Uh, so you're gonna want to add in your nutrients but before you do it's very important to degas your mead. Uh, so Degassing is basically just removing all the CO2 that the fermentation is producing. Uh, so the yeast is going to produce quite a bit of CO2 during the process and you're going to want to remove that all uh, every day, at least once or twice a day uh, during the first, uh, um, uh, first half of your fermentation. So basically the easiest way to do so, especially with this size of a batch, is using something like a, uh, a mixing attachment on a power drill. Uh, so this is a really great uh, uh, tool that I would use quite often at home. Uh, you basically attach it to a, a, a drill, uh, close it back up, and you can see how, how much that'll actually whisk up the batch inside of the bucket. Uh, it's plastic on plastic, it's less susceptible to scratching the inside of the bucket, but still be careful with that. Try not to hit the inside of the bucket too much, but this will remove a lot of the CO2 from your mead. Uh, something uh, simple as that. Uh, or something at a hardware store, for example, like a paint stirrer, uh, will work just as effectively as well. But uh, you want to remove all the CO2 out of your mead before adding any nutrients into your mead. Uh, the reason for which is once you add nutrients, uh, dry nutrients into a mead full of CO2, uh, it's going to create nucleation points and can start creating a lot of foam and it will most likely foam over the top of your bucket, especially when you're using a carboy. Do not add nutrients, dry nutrients, or even uh, wet nutrients into your mead before you degas. Um, because especially in a carboy with the neck um, going in at the top, you're gonna create a lot of trapped airspace and you're just essentially creating a volcano of mead. Uh, your ceiling will turn different colors if you keep that practice up uh, as my basement ceiling is. Uh, so keep that in mind, degas your mead, then add your nutrient additions. So temperature is also a very important step in the fermentation process, something to take uh, into consideration. Certain yeasts are gonna have certain uh, temperature ranges that they perform the best at. Uh, so you're gonna have your minim minimum and your maximum temperature ranges. And you're gonna wanna look for that on um, uh, Scott Labs website, or if you go onto our Mead Made Right website, uh, you'll actually see a link for all the specific Lalamon brand yeasts and their temperature requirements. 
But uh, for the most part, overall, you're gonna wanna ferment around, uh, if you can, around your 62 to 64. If you get down to 60, even better. Uh, but 62, 64, um, degrees Fahrenheit is a really, really great fermentation temperature. Uh, nice and low so you don't produce a lot of fusel alcohol uh, um, in your mead. And so you're going to be able to drink it uh, a lot sooner. It's not going to smell or taste boozy, for example. Uh, so the lower temperature you can ferment at, the better. Don't go any lower than 60, not really necessary, uh, especially for most yeasts that have a minimum around uh, 58, 59 degrees. So you don't want to get too, too low in that range. Uh, but make sure you keep temperature under control. Don't keep this in a hot room or anywhere in your house where the sun might be coming in through the window and hitting it. Keep it in a dark, cool closet. Uh, there's different methods of uh, temperature controlling uh, something in a bucket or in a carboy at home. Uh, something you can do is, a, is a, called a swamp cooler, uh, where you basically take some kind of a, a tote or um, uh, fill it up with water, enough water to have a, uh, a blanket around or a t-shirt wrapped around your carboy or bucket that dips into the water and have a fan basically just blowing air on it all day that actually can drop the temperature of a carboy or a bucket uh, with fermenting product in it for, by at least like eight degrees from uh, ambient temperature. So that's a different, uh, significant uh, drop in temperature using something as simple as like a wet t-shirt with a fan on it. Uh, so you can also spend more money on getting more, um, uh, you know, higher tech equipment, uh, maybe throwing in a, um, throwing your bucket or carboy into a small like college fridge that's big enough just for that one vessel or into a chest freezer or, or big unused refrigerator uh, with the temperature controller on it that'll regulate the, uh, the power of the refrigerator on and off to control the temperature to whatever you set it to. Um, that's my preferred method of doing that because then you could also always dial in the exact fermenta uh, fermentation temperature that you want for that particular batch. So the more consistency you have with temperature and, and, and the more you pay attention to temperature overall during your fermentation process is gonna make consistent and great mead. Uh, so if you ferment, uh, if you were to make a 10 gallon mix of honey and water and split it into two separate fermentation uh, vessels, and you were to ferment one at 60 degrees and one at 78 degrees, you are gonna notice a big, big difference between the two. So if you wanna make really great mead, um, that's really smooth uh, to drink, really nice uh, and tasty without fusel alcohols, you're gonna to wanna to ferment lower. Uh, if you don't, uh, you're gonna get a whole different final product that might take a lot longer to age out some of the all flavors and fusel alcohols that that might produce. So aging your mead. Uh, you could either age your mead in a plastic bucket, just like you could ferment in. Uh, you could age them in plastic carboys, glass carboys, glass jugs. Uh, there's all these different types of options out there on the market for them. Uh, but uh, one thing in particular as far as aging goes is your airlock. So if you're gonna age your mead for quite some time, one thing to keep into consideration is the type of airlock that you use. So, your, your average airlock is gonna look like this. Sometimes they also have these S type of airlocks uh, that basically are exactly the same as far as function goes. Uh, you fill it up with some uh, sanitizer or some people even use vodka um, inside of your airlock. Uh, the, the CO2, the air is able to escape uh, through the water and bubble out, uh, escape through the top of the airlock, but there's no oxygen that's able to come back into the meat itself. Uh, so that's basically how an airlock works. So this, again, is one filled with sanitizer, uh, which is just fine. But if you're going to age this for an extended period of time, you're going to end up forgetting about it. And what will happen is, little by little, that sanitizer uh, might start uh, evaporating away. Uh, and before you know it, your airlock goes dry. And guess who shows up? Fruit flies. Fruit flies will work their way into the tiny little pinholes at the top and work, your, work their way down into the airlock and into your mead. Uh, and it can also um, oxidize your mead during the aging process. So that's another thing to keep in mind is uh, if you're gonna age mead for a prolonged period of time, make sure to stay on top of your airlocks and make sure that they don't uh, evaporate away on you and go dry. Uh, another option and a really great tip is uh, to use dry airlocks that don't use any water at all. Uh, so there's two different types here. One that could be commonly found online um, is this airlock here. Uh, it's from Better Bottle. Uh, the manufacturers of these actual uh, plastic carboys as well, and they have a, a whole slew of different accessories 
uh, like a little mini racking arm, for example, uh, so you can rack your meat off of sediment within the carboy. Uh, and the dry airlocks. The dry airlocks in particular are really great because they work basically with a little tiny marble uh, inside of the airlock itself uh, that moves out of the way whenever there's CO2 being released. So the CO2 comes out of, through the airlock, moves the marble, uh, little tiny marble out of the way. The CO2 is able to escape. The marble falls back in its place, covering the hole, preventing any oxygen from going back in. Uh, so this is really great for extended aging. Uh, so you don't have to keep uh, on top of it drying out on you. It is a dry airlock, so uh, you can forget about it indefinitely and it'll never allow oxygen back into your mead. Uh, another option is, uh, these are a, le a lot less commonly found in the homebrew scene, but you could find them on some uh, professional winery uh, websites, uh, supply shops. It's basically the same thing as one of these um, better bottle dry airlocks. Uh, it's just on a much bigger scale. There's, a much, uh, there's actually two marbles that work within this housing, uh, but it works basically exactly the same. Uh, so keep that in mind when aging your mead. Uh, make sure to use some dry airlocks. If not, just make sure to keep on top of your uh, uh, other airlocks to make sure they don't go dry on you. All right, so there are many different styles of mead. Uh, we have uh, a plethora of different unique recipes that we make here at the meadery um, that you can make at home as well. Uh, so we have everything from uh, sparkling mead uh, to traditional mead, uh, which a traditional mead is mainly just uh, honey and water. So you're either highlighting just one type of honey varietal uh, with the water or a blend of different honey varietals uh, mixed together. Uh, so <clears throat> that's uh, considered a traditional mead. Uh, then you could get into your mellow mels, which a mellow mel is basically a mead with fruit. Uh, so there's different types of mellow mels. So there are sizers. Uh, which is a mellow mel specifically used um, uh, that you use apples or apple juice with, apple cider, uh, that you ferment with the honey. Uh, then there are piments that you use uh, at actual grapes or grape juice with the honey. Uh, then you actually have just your average mellow mel, which could be any kind of other different fruit or mixes of different fruits. So for example, here uh, we have a mead that we made with red prickly pears. Uh, this is a a mead made with a light blend of berry juices. Uh, this is a mead made with a, a blend of dark uh, berries, dark fruits uh, like black currants, black cherries, uh, black berry, uh, blackberry, and black raspberry. Uh, so then you have uh, your methaglins, where methaglins are meads that are made with use of spices. Uh, so uh, this one in particular, we actually use coffee. Uh, we got some freshly ground. Uh, espresso beans, uh, freshly roasted for us actually here in New Jersey, brought them over to the meadery, freshly ground them here. We cold brewed the coffee um, and blended all that coffee into the finish, uh, finished uh, mead at the end until we got it to the right amount of coffee flavor and character that we wanted in the mead. So as you can see, you have uh, quite the creative window here uh, for possibilities when it comes to making mead, uh, particularly when you're making fruit meads. Uh, like I said, you can use one type of fruit, a blend of different fruits, fruit juices, uh, whatever, what have you. So uh, as far as using fruit in a mead, uh, I think there's two different uh, options that you have. You could either use the fruit up front uh, and ferment all the fruit with your honey and water, or you can use the fruit after fermentation is over. So one thing to consider is when you're using fruit or any other ingredient actually, uh, that's gonna go through fermentation with the honey, the fermentation process is going to scrub out some of the flavors and aromas and basically kind of change them. Uh, the whole character is going to change quite a bit. Just think of it, uh, think of a uh, grape wine. It goes in as grape juice, comes out as wine. I mean, it is going to change quite a bit in the product. So when you use fruit up front during the fermentation process, you're going to get this really interesting kind of entwined, um, integrated uh, fruit character with the product, which I particularly like. Whenever I use fruit, I ferment the fruit with the honey. Uh, if you use fruit after the fact, that's also another option that you can do. Uh, you're going to get a lot more of that raw fruit character. Uh, that whether you like it or not, that's where you're going to get if you use it after fermentation. So with some recipes, it might be advantageous to do that. Uh, and some recipes, it might not. Uh, so it's really up to you and up to experimenting. Uh, as far as spices go, the use of spices in a methaglin, uh, I believe, should be used after fermentation. Adding the spices in the beginning of fermentation to go through the fermentation process, again, is going to change the flavor 
uh, of and the aroma of those spices quite a bit. So if you want to really preserve everything that those particular spices or coffee, for example, vanilla beans, uh, star anise, cinnamon, whatever you want to add into your mead, uh, you're going to want to preserve that raw spice character. Uh, if not, it's going to change quite a bit throughout the fermentation process. So one thing, uh, one rule of thumb that I always keep to, uh, in practice is whenever I use spices, I add it after. Whenever I use fruit, I add it before fermentation. So some troubleshooting tips for uh, once, once your meat is actually done fermenting and aged out, uh, you can actually find that some meads may be lacking a little bit in acidity or maybe have too much acidity if the pH dropped too much during fermentation process. Uh, it could be too sweet or too dry compared to how you were really, uh, what you were really targeting for that final product. Uh, so some real quick troubleshooting tips are, if you have a mead that goes really, really too dry, you would have to, you would have to add way too much honey to really save it, to, to create it into something that you would rather have it be. Uh, I would recommend just saving that mead on the side uh, and using it uh, whenever you do have a mead that maybe came out too sweet, for example, and using that dry mead now to do some blending and blending of the two down to uh, a more homogenous uh, sweet spot, for example, pardon the pun. Uh, so if it's too much acidity, one good thing to do is to add sweetness to balance out the acidity. If the mead is too sweet, uh, adding acidity will balance out the sweetness. So uh, you can use both of those uh, to balance each other. As far as adding a, a sweetness, the easy thing, obviously, and the most obvious thing, obvious thing to do would be to add honey. Uh, dilute a little honey into water and add that into the mead. If you want to add acidity, uh, there's different products on the market, such as Acid Blend, uh, which I don't particularly like, but that's gonna be the most common uh, form of acid additions that you can purchase, which is a blend of three different types of acids. Uh, it's citric acid, tartaric acid, and malic acid. I recommend just purchasing uh, the three acids separately, uh, which you can do from most homebrew supply shops. Uh, instead of buying the acid blend um, all bunched up because the acid blend is going to be predominantly citric acid no matter who you buy it from and that might not be the type of acid that you want to add to that particular mead. So buy the different acid additions separately on an experiment with those and you'll find that you can uh, add tartaric acid to a piment, a mead made with grapes. Uh, because the tartaric acid is more commonly found in grape juice, so it'll be more uh, suitable uh, type of acid addition to put into that type of a mead. Uh, the malic acid, malic acid is normally found in uh, apples predominantly. Uh, that'll be a great acid choice uh, to add acidity to a sizer, a mead made with apple juice or apples. Uh, so as you can see, using an acid blend might not cover all of your bases. You could fine tune your acid additions quite a bit uh, if you buy them all separately. Thank you for joining us. For more information about how to make mead, visit our website called meadmaderight.com. For more information about the types of products that we offer at Melovino, you can go to melovino.com for more information on to how to purchase more products and ship directly to you for tour and tasting information as well.